reconvene the June 18th, 2014 Town Council meeting. Uh, next on the agenda will be general public comments. Uh, I'll be, actually I'd like to hear from uh, people here um, that want to talk about something other than what's uh, on for uh, orders. So uh, Benjamin Farm will be coming up under old business. Um, so if you'd like to make general public comments, three minutes, uh, name and address, please. Anyone want to talk about anything other than the Benjamin <laughs> Farm? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll close this public general public comments. Uh, minutes of June 4th meeting. Make approval. Second. Any errors or omissions? None. All those in favor? Opposed? None. Uh, adjustments to the agenda. Yes. Um, the, the council needs to adopt the school budget resolution, which is a state requirement. It's also part of the school budget validation, school budget validation re referendum. This would be the last order on the agenda. Okay. Okay, treasurer's warrants are here. I'll be signing those. Um, okay, order number 1454 is a 7 p.m. public hearing on the proposed changes to 601, the town of Scarborough traffic ordinance. Okay, any from the anyone from the public like to speak on uh, chapter 601 changes to the traffic ordinance? Anyone here? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Do I have a motion? Oh. The second reading will be held on July 16th. Oh. I'm sorry, okay. That's okay. Yep. okay under old, old business, business. Uh, order number 1455 is a second reading to approve the expenditure in an amount not to exceed $2 million from the Land Acquisition Reserve Fund for the purpose of purchasing the so-called Benjamin Farm, located more specifically identified by the Scarborough Tax Assessor's Map 95, Lot 5A, 6, and 10, and as recommended by the Parks and Conservation Land Board and authorize the town manager to execute any and all documents as are necessary to protect the town's interest. Okay, I'll start with a public hearing. I'm at, uh, hearing from the public. Anyone that would like to speak, please come up to the podium. Name and address, please. On the Benjamin Farm. Good evening, my name is Melissa Anson. I live at One Haystack Circle, which is very close to Benjamin Farm. I would encourage the Scarborough Town Council to support Scarborough Land Trust's application to the land bond to purchase the Benjamin Farm. I've spoken to neighbors about this project and they've all said that they've been wondering for years and holding their breath, hoping that something could be done to save Benjamin Farm. Well, we're here right now with that opportunity. When I think about this project, I'm so excited by the huge number of people who would benefit from conserving Benjamin Farm. Benjamin Farm is the only large, unprotected piece of land in the most densely developed part of town. I think of the adults who would like to go for a walk when they come home from work. They'd like to get out into nature, but they don't have time to drive across town to go to another land trust trail before dinner. Mostly, though, I think of the kids nearby. As of today, it's officially summer vacation. Don't we want our children to have great nearby opportunities to get out and explore nature? Don't we want them to enjoy being active outdoors? I know a lot of us grew up that way, but each generation sees kids spending less and less time outdoors. My parents and their generation spent their summer days entirely outside, going who knows where. They'd return home at night, hopefully in time for dinner. When I was growing up, I played with my neighbors outside in my small contained neighborhood, and I checked in with my mom if I wanted to eat lunch at a friend's house. Even since then, things have changed drastically, especially with the prevalence of electronics. Screen time just wasn't a term when I was growing up, which wasn't that long ago. We know getting outside and experiencing nature is good for kids and adults alike. Time spent in nature keeps kids healthy, lessens stress, and even makes them smarter. Pleasant Hill School is less than a mile away from Benjamin Farm. Think of the educational opportunities in this convenient outdoor classroom. 
The Benjamin Farm is one of those unique places in Scarborough. Scarborough has always been known as a rural town. You can look at nearby cities, Portland, Saco, and Biddeford. They have long histories of industry and commerce with historic downtowns and riverside mills. Scarborough simply doesn't have this type of heritage, but it does have its own. Scarborough historically was known for shipbuilding, fishing, and farming. Benjamin Farm offers the last opportunity to preserve a farm in the Pleasant Hill neighborhood, an area once known for farming, but an area that would not have any farms left if Benjamin Farm was lost. I think we need to not only understand and appreciate this farming history, but celebrate it. We're proud of our farming past in Scarborough, and we want to stay connected with the Scarborough that existed before we lived here. I don't want to live in a town where 10 years from now, I look around and all the recognizable landmarks are gone. We need to carefully select the land that is worth conserving and work to make it happen. Benjamin Farm is that property for Scarborough. I think of the land bond application for $2 million as not simply an expenditure, but as an investment. We have to think about what can we do to improve our town? What can we do to make Scarborough a better place to live? This is not just an item on a budget that must be approved every year. This is a one-time upfront investment in your community. $2 million is a lot of money, but looking at the costs avoided by purchasing the land, it will pay itself off over the years. And then there are the tremendous benefits to the public of Scarborough. This should be a no-brainer. The beauty of Benjamin Farm is that once we purchase it, it will be there forever. That means you, your kids, your grandchildren can all go there for recreation whenever you want but so can countless generations beyond that. That's the beauty of a land trust. Scarborough Land Trust preserves land for people and for wildlife forever. Thank you, and I would urge you to support the community by approving the land bond. Thank you. Next. Hi, this is Suzanne Foley Ferguson. Is it, this is the public hearing. You, you don't have them on two separate agenda items, but so this is both the public hearing and the second reading? What's that? It only requires the first and second reading. Okay, so you're just doing that's nice. Okay, that's good. Um, I'm the chair of the Parks and Conservation Land Board, and I just for for folks that are here from the land board or from the public that don't know, we've been um, the town. The citizens have already approved this money uh, three times. We voted, and the, and the council is aware of this. That three times that the citizens have voted to spend money. The Benjamin Farm in during our first land bond, um, the Benjamin Farm was on everybody's radar. We knew way back in the 2000s that this was a property in the heart of the town that we would really, really want. Unfortunately, it was very, very difficult, 13 years of negotiation, and the land trust has done a great job of that. And we at the la in the land board, while we're supposed to be objective, I will say that it Every time a project came before us, we thought, oh, geez, is this going to eliminate the fund? Because what if the Benjamin Farm comes up? <laughs> we always were afraid to say, yeah, yeah, fund this project, because, oh, gosh, are we going to have enough money if, the ben if and when the Benjamin Farm comes up? So you should know that the Benjamin Farm scored the second highest of all the land that we've ever evaluated, and that includes current town lands such as Tibbetts Road, which is a beautiful piece of property. Um, the sec if it was a working farm, it would have scored even higher. So we wholeheartedly support this project. It's a great project. We're here for questions and photographs if people want to, from the council would like to see any more or have any more questions. Um, but we wholeheartedly uh, support the $2 million. We know it's, it's, it's a tough amount in this tough time. It does leave 400000 at least, plus or minus, in the account for future purchases, and we think that citizens of the community have supported um, the land, and this is the exact kind of property that we, we want to support. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Good evening. My name is Dan Brazo. My address is 6 Indian Rock Road, um, just off Pleasant Hill. Um, I, my wife and I just recently moved to Scarborough from Buffalo, New York. We um, accepted positions at the University of New England's Portland campus where we're professors. 
and uh, I can make this fairly quick, which will stun my students, but <laughs> basically when we decided to come to Maine and to Portland, we looked at many, many homes in the Portland area, not only here in Scarborough, but just about everywhere, including Portland itself, and we ultimately decided on the home we have here in Scarborough, and one of the major factors in that decision was the fact that this was such a pleasant rural community with lots of open space, lots of parks and beaches that was a very easy to get in and out of Portland too. And so I would just strongly encourage that this purchase be made because this is a significant piece of land and will go a long way to keeping Scarborough the sort of place that ultimately affected our decision. Thank you. Anyone else? David Benjamin, 105 Spurwink Road. I know that each of you serve on the town council because of your personal commitment to this town, both individually and as a group. And one of the most difficult things for the town council and for all of us is to have time for future vision while we're dealing primarily with the incidences of the current and the present. And one of the hallmarks of leadership is vision. And I know each of you serve in this capacity in part because of your strength of vision in the town. And as other speakers have alluded to, people live in Scarborough to a large degree because they like our history. They like the fact that this is an outdoor-oriented town. They like the fact that this is a town that intersperses clusters of housing with beautiful natural and open spaces. And I urge you to use the vision that you possess to go forward with this particular proposal. Additionally, the importance of funding it fully, up to the $2 million mark, is critical because other funding modalities that would have to take the place of that would require outsiders to contribute the money. And with that come strings and conditions, be they from state organizations or national organizations. And again, one of the things that we tend to value locally in Scarborough is our ability to control our own destiny. And by funding this locally and keeping it for ourselves to manage within our community, we then hold the vision for our own future. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Hi, Richard. Hi. Uh, Eric Knott, 19 Williamsburg Lane. Uh, I'm a fourth generation uh, Scarborough resident. The fifth generation is tearing up outside here. <laughs> um, you and I, Richard, have gone to school together. We've seen land in this town go quick, big parcels. This is an opportunity to secure a premier spot that we'll never see again in our lifetime. Our children will never see this again, ever. If we don't get this now, at the full amount, we could lose it forever, just like a lot of the pieces we've lost over the years. My suggestion to the board would be to fund this at full $2 million and get it done with. And I think everyone here is, agrees with that. So I would hope that we could get this done tonight and then move on and <coughs> save this land. So thank you. Thank you, Eric. <coughs> Anyone else? Seeing no one else, I close and do have a motion. <coughs> Council discussion. Who wants to be go first? Uh, well, I have Council to, Holbrook. to offer. Holbrook. Uh, well, each of you has received in front of you tonight a handout from um, town manager. That would be to, um, so my motion is to replace the current um, order with the order as you see it written in front of you for this evening. If there's a second, Tom will talk a little bit about what sure. that changes. I'll second it. Okay, we have an amendment and a second. Yes, um, partially in response to questions and some concerns raised by members of council um, at your last meeting in the intervening days, um, and also a recognition that the order as it was passed in first re reading 
probably wasn't thorough enough and, and didn't fully articulate um, some of the details. And frankly, we don't know all those details. But I've been involved in, I think, three of these um, similar de um, closings. And there's always a flurry of activity leading up to closing to make sure the town's interests uh, are properly protected going forward. Uh, we've tried to, and the effect of this motion does several things. Essentially, um, it authorizes me to sign documents. It doesn't exactly say what, they'll, what they are. That piece will develop over time. Uh, but those documents that we deem necessary to protect, preserve, and secure the town's interests. Uh, that may take shape in, by way of uh, conservation easement or covenants. There's any number of ways to do that. But using significant public funds, I think it only stands to reason that the town should maintain some level of interest in the property. Uh, again, that's not dissimilar from uh, what we've done in the past. I just think it's healthy to articulate it here as part of your authorization. The other portion of it speaks to um, the issue of kind of the ongoing efforts. There are fundraising commitments that have been made by the land trust. There's also any number of other opportunities. Uh, some have been explored and fully explored. Others might uh, come up between now and closing. Uh, there is a fair amount of time between now and the end of the year. And uh, the other part of this amendment uh, really encourages the land trust not to give up on those efforts to further leverage local monies. Um, and to the extent that you're successful beyond your commitment of the fundraising, that those go back to the land bond fund so they can be again used uh, for another project for another day. So that's a quite a wordy summary, if you will. Um, but that's the intent of this of, the, of these changes. I do have a, a few copies. If anyone wants to see that, I did distribute that to the council. I should also mention that I. Uh, I have worked with uh, two members of the land trust directly. I, I believe they're both here. They can speak for themselves. But I, I think I offer these with uh, their blessing. Jeremy is nodding at me. Okay, with that, is there <coughs> any discussions on the amendment? Councilor Kennerino? Um, as someone who grew up in South Portland, Next to Scarborough, uh, I'm thrilled uh, to be able to preserve this land. I've driven by there my whole life. I saw over time how Pleasant Hill kept growing and growing and growing. And I watched in dismay as the uh, barn fell down, that beautiful brick barn. Um, however, um, I feel very strongly that we have an opportunity here to preserve the largest piece of land that's on the side of Route 1, and as one speaker mentioned, this is not an expenditure, it's an investment. It's an investment in our future, uh, and I, I hate, I'd hate to be around 100 years from now and have that all changed. So anyway, that's where I come from with this. I support this. Okay. Any other discussion on the amendment? Councilor Donovan. Just speaking just to the amendment, uh, I think it's uh, important, protective language, to uh, uh, allow the town the ability to uh, pursue this uh, bond funding project in a manner that uh, protects the town's interests. Uh, and so uh, I think it's quite appropriate to, to support the amendment. Okay, seeing no, no one else. Okay, on the amendment to the main motion, all those in favor? Hmm. Opposed? Passed. Back to the main motion. Discussion? Oh, then everybody jump up and down. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll go. Um, if that's all right. <clears throat> so um, in a nutshell, like I so said, the amendment just protected um, the town's interest a little bit. It does become a little bit um, problematic where, um, and, I, and I mean no disrespect to the land trust, but it is a private entity. Um, so this, again, secures the interest of the town a little bit further um, so that, that there's some protection and perpetuity that, um, you know, this isn't going to get sold later or if something happens and the trust is dissolved, that you know this stays w within the confines of the town. Um, 
As I mentioned before um, at the last meeting, my, my concern wasn't so much. I, I Again, I fully support preserving Benjamin Farm. I fully support the concept of, you know, it saves money in the long run. It's, you know, let's face it, it's Pleasant Hill. It's high-density building. You'd have a kid factory being built up there. Um, so, you know, I, I, I did, you know, understand the, the concept. Of, what I do like of this is that it does open up the opportunity that not only can the land trust also have some opportunity to try to pursue more funds, that we as a mm -hmm. town have some opportunity to try to maybe help you do that to secure those funds. Um, like I said, you know, I do support um, supporting the ben buying the purchase of the Benjamin Farm. Um, and again, my comments that at, at the last meeting, it was just more to do with I, I have no confidence that a land bond at this point in time would pass in front of the voter. And I do appreciate it. It was passed three times, but it certainly was, you know, a different economic climate. So, um, again, you know, very carefully picking and choosing. Land is important, and once it's gone, it is gone. But I do also want to point out Scarborough, Maine, is the largest freshwater marsh in the entire eastern seaboard. So we have substantial amounts of land. That that and and again, I don't dispute the Benjamin Farm isn't a worthy purchase. And I support the two million, but there's that other piece, which is what I was talking about. As we lose the land, we've also lost the monuments, the sites, the structures. Benjamin Farm, um, and, and as may you may or may not know, I've been involved with um, the Historic Preservation Committee. Benjamin Farm was on the initial short list, but because there's nothing of value left of the structures, it's no longer meeting the criteria to make the list. So that was my point. As we're moving forward, what little funds are left, knowing that this is what we have, we, we also need to keep our eye on that other second secondary piece. Um, so again, hopefully, um, I, I do. You know, I support the two million. I hope you raise the other five hundred thousand. I hope there's something that we can do to help you secure even maybe a little more. Um, and I guess I'll just leave my my comments at that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councilor Donovan? Uh, this is, uh, I see this as a great win-win situation. Uh, it's obviously a fabulous property to conserve, uh, unique in, and particularly in its geographic location within the community, uh, and therefore uh, in one of the most densely populated portions of our community, we will add uh, a large tract to other tracts that abut it, that are uh, in a conservancy state. So that, that's wonderful. I think from a responsible expenditure of money, uh, this in the long run saves tax dollars. Uh, and the case has been made in the materials that have been submitted to us. So I think that uh, that's a terrific part of it. Uh, uh, I conferred with Scarborough Land Trust members and the town manager to understand the prospects for additional funding and timing is everything. Mm. You know, the, the chance is here now to acquire this property. You can't always also get all of the funding opportunities to line up perfectly. Uh, and so the language that was proposed and, and presented uh, uh, for amendment allows us more flexibility. And that's, that's important because we do want to try to avail ourselves of any opportunity that comes along, and those may be post-closing. And, and therefore, uh, the, the ones that were identified as potentially available in the future convince me that, that going for the whole $2 million at this point is prudent. It is not using up all the funds, but that <clears throat> there are going to be opportunities for replenishment that we can't necessarily identify this minute, uh, but that they uh, have a realistic chance of presenting themselves. And so under those circumstances, as I've been educated in understanding this process and the long trail to get to where we are through the Scarborough Land Trust uh, decade and a half of effort, then I think this, the prudent thing for our town to do is to approve the two million. Thank you. Council. Blaze, I think, was next. Yep. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Benjamin a number of years ago. 
Um, I had a friend that used to go up to the farm and um, feed the cows with them. And I went up there one day, and Mr. Benjamin was a wonderful person. Uh, he had a vision uh, for the farm. He loved the farm. Uh, he told me how he had purchased it, and the story is amazing, but I'm not going to even get into it, but I'm sure a lot of you people know. He just drove by, and it was for sale, and he just made an offer, and he bought it, like, in five minutes. <laughs> uh, Fifteen years. But he loved that land. And I think a lot of people that live in the Pleasant Hill area love that land. And I'm dying to get out there and explore it, like I'm sure a lot of people are. Um, this is a no-brainer. This is something that we have to do, and I'm going to support it wholeheartedly. Thank you. are spending $2 million. <laughs> <laughs> the voters approved it. Councilor Benedict. I guess the main thing I want to say is that I... And we've said it a couple of times this year. There's nothing worse than being a Monday morning quarterback. Passing on opportunities, you just kick yourself in the butt, saying, why didn't I, why didn't I? And this has been on the map 14, 15 years, and I'm certainly glad that the land trust had the opportunity to look at it, to equate it, and to move on it. Between that and the other end of it is the money has already been appropriated. So it's not it's not a matter of money. It's a matter of retaining what the town has the ability to buy the money already made for. And as Ed said, it's really a no brainer. I will I'll be supporting it. Anyone else? Okay. Um, I'm definitely supporting it, and uh, one of the reasons why is um, I feel the voters of the town of Scarborough voted for the bond, um, and it was overwhelming. Uh, we voted for a school. Um, we built uh, building the school. We voted for a new ladder truck. We um, we went forward and bought that. Now it's, I think it's up to the council uh, to be the best judge of what lands are purchased. The land trust does a great job, but still the public entrusts us to um, help in those decisions. And I think it is a great decision. It would be a great purchase. Um, I knew Mr. Benjamin also. I uh, helped him out a lot, helped him fix his equipment. I helped him do some of the... Uh, um, away from the farm farming um, to uh, uh, and uh, I miss I miss you know uh, talking to him he was a great guy but before him uh, I remember when I was a kid it was I believe it was referred to as a Robinson farm and it's too bad to have seen the buildings um, go the way they did but um, in in uh, talking with uh, Councillor Holbrook um, you know, in the future we're going to try to um, preserve some of these um, landmarks in Scarborough, some of these old farms. We've seen, uh, as a kid here in Scarborough, I've seen a lot of beautiful buildings um, be demolished, um, even right in this local area, right here. There was two beautiful um, houses here. Uh, one beautiful barn and a house right where uh, the El Rayo is going now. It was a beautiful place, and it was a shame to see it go. Um, so this is very important. I think it's very important to a lot of people in Scarborough, a lot of people that have lived here for generations. So I'm definitely supporting this, and I'm very happy that this is taking place. And it's been a long time. We've talked about it and talked about it and talked about it. And... Um, one of the things uh, Councilor Donovan said, I always was saying, you know, we keep taking this property out of, um, you know, out of the tax rolls, but uh, the land trust did a good job, I think, of uh, presenting what the impact is when the land's built on 
the impact to the town. So I think this is a great way to save property and save expenditures for the town. So I'm definitely in favor of it. Anyone else? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? None. Well, that feels good after <laughs> eight months. <laughs> I guess we did something, right? <laughs> yeah, um, I'll take a couple of minutes uh, recess. If uh, anyone here would like to leave now, they can, or they can stay for the rest of the meeting. <laughs> I'd like to bring the meeting back to order. Uh, next, new business. Under new business order number 1457 is the first reading and referred to the planning board that proposed amendments to the town of Scarborough official zoning map to designate the RH, RH2, and RF districts in the vicinity of Holmes Road and Gorham Road. 
Okay, I believe Dan has a presentation for us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm presenting on behalf of the Long Range Planning Committee, and actually this uh, brief PowerPoint is going to uh, incorporate this order that's before you and also the next two. So there's a, zo a proposed zoning map change, zoning ordinance change, and then a slight adjustment to the, to the plumbing ordinance, which is all related to this proposal. Um, and this is actually one of the last remaining areas the Long Range Planning Committee has been working on in terms of implementing the comprehensive plan, so maybe uh, fewer presentations in the future to the Council on this uh, topic. Um, and this map here uh, is trying to uh, focus you on the area of town we're talking about, and, and that area is um, in the vicinity of Gorham Road. And this map before you is the town's future land use plan that um, illustrates, generally speaking, where um, growth is recommended by zoning and the comprehensive plan and where less growth, growth or more limited growth is recommended. The yellow is the growth areas of town and the greens are the more limited growth areas. Uh, so this area is really on the fringe or the transition from um, the town's more built up areas to the rural area west of uh, the main turnpike. Um, this aerial photo zooms in and highlights the particular properties that um, this zoning package is proposed for, and it's largely made up of an unsuch golf course um, and the 18 holes there. Um, there's also some small lots along Gorham Road, so Gorham Road is two-thirds of the way up the screen. Um, you see the main turnpike is the eastern edge of this area, and the southern edge is Holmes Road um, and featured speedway area, et cetera. And to the west is uh, the Libby family um, property and uh, the Scarborough Fish and Game Club. The Nunsuch River is in this vicinity. So this is the area that's um, been looked at by the Long Range Planning Committee. And it's, it's close to a lot of things. It's close to Payne Road. It's close to the growth along Main Mall. It also has a very rural character, um, and so it, it really is a transition area for the community, or could be in the future as, as things happen. Um, there's not any pending development proposed. It's not being looked at specifically because there's a handful of proposals for development. It's just planning ahead with zoning so that when development is interested in this area, um, the zoning's, the proper zoning's in place. Um, so really the comprehensive plan land use goals for the area is to serve as a transition or a gateway from the more rural part of Scarborough and um, to the more built up commercial section, particularly along Payne Road and the main turnpike, um, to enable development to happen that's kind of complementary to what's already there. Uh, the golf course, the Nonsuch River, the area is again a rural character area, not a um, <coughs> kind of a commercial uh, developed area, and to enable a mix of residential, commercial, and, and senior or elderly type housing in this area that can capitalize on its location but still respect the, the nature of the, this part of town. Um, this map shows you how it's zoned today. So this is the current zoning. Again, the orange area outlines roughly where we're talking about. And so the, the bright red is the town's business to zone, our general business district that uh, allows the most in terms of commercial development. Um, so uh, large retail, uh, restaurants, drive through restaurants, office, um, really kind of the Payne Road, Scarborough Gallery type development can occur um, in the B2. And then right next to it, in the light green, uh, at least moving east to west, is the rural and farming district. Um, so the committee looked at the current zoning and um, it's been this way for um, decades at this point, probably back to the 60s, um, and felt that it really wasn't, if development's going to happen, it's not going to kind of be that gateway and, and, and be the character that the comprehensive plan talks about or be a transition. It's, it'd be pretty um, abrupt from intense commercial to, to rural development. Um, so in lieu of that, uh, the committee looked hard at it other zoning options, looked at the zoning that was passed a handful of years ago for the Running Hill area to the north, um, and after a lot of discussion is recommending um, the, at least on both sides of Gorham Road, um, the two different Running Hill zones, which are mixed-use zones, 
that allow for some commercial, less intense commercial development, allow some for some residential development. It can be multifamily, townhouse, single family, um, and also allow for some assisted living, senior housing type development that um, could occur that might be along the golf course and be part of that complex um, and that could be a transition type area um, with proper utilities. And then to the south, um, you'll see closer to Holmes Road, uh, the committee's proposing an RF district for that uh, particular area because it's quite distant from future water sewer extension. It's pretty isolated from the rest of this area given the Nunsuch River, um, breaks the golf course in, in half from the front nine to the back, um, and is, is really more, it's pretty wet, so it's more conducive to some residential development that could happen along the golf course. Um, so that's the zoning map component of your uh, agenda. And um, the zoning ordinance amendments are really um, kind of tailoring the, the current running hill zones and uh, for use in this area. The running hill zones are set up for the running hill area. Um, and so there's a bit of broadening that happened by Long Range Planning Committee so it could apply to this area and, and, and meet the goals um, for this area. There aren't ma major changes, but there are adjustments like setbacks to the street for Gorham Road, like setbacks to uh, and buffering to some neighboring um, rural properties and so that there isn't um, intent development that occurs right up to next to a rural and farm property or a single family house that has two acres. Um, so those are the type of amendments that are in the, the zoning ordinance amendment section um, of the proposal before you. The other component of the zoning ordinance amendments are um, to the conservation subdivision standards. Um, those are standards that enable and in many cases require in the rural zone um, smaller single family house lots um, in exchange for preserving wetlands, um, so clustering so that uh, development can, can occur on say 50% of the land, the other 50% can be conserved um, for wetland preservation and the like. Um, we looked at these standards and given the existence of a golf course, particularly the back nine that um, is, could better accommodate just some single family houses or, or other types of residential development that the committee felt that adding an allowance for golf courses to be part of the open space and conservation subdivisions made sense um, and in exchange for seeing some residential development then the golf course and say the wetlands around it or the natural area around it would also need to be preserved. So it's enabling some residential development and preserving the golf course as some open space. Um, and so that's what those amendments entail. Um, so that that's another use of the conservation subdivision approach in the community. Um, so that's in a nutshell the the highlights or the, the big picture on the proposed changes. And as I mentioned at the outset, there's order 1457 is the zoning map amendment. Um, 1458 are the zoning ordinance amendments for the, the running hill districts and the conservation subdivision uh, standards. And the last order, 1459, are some adjustments to the plumbing ordinance to allow um, in the running hill districts um, if there is going to be uh, two-family or multi-family development that isn't served by sewer, that they can utilize a, a shared septic system, um, which has been allowed for in some other areas of town where uh, the town is allowed for that type of housing on served by septic. So that's the package before you, and um, should it be successful at first reading, it would go to the planning board for public hearing as a next step. Okay, um, comments from the public? Seeing none, do I have a motion? Uh, move approval. Second. Okay, Councilor Questions. Councilor Holbrook. Uh, I had a 
question surrounding, um, well, two things. Um, the first one is, has there been any um, neighborhood meetings or outreach to the individual property owners where the changes are taking place? And if so, what kind of feedback were you receiving from them? One of the uh, neighbors is two seats to, to, to your right. Yeah. Your left. Um, <laughs> good, great question. I should have mentioned that in the presentation. We did have a, a neighborhood meeting in April. Um, it was at the Eight Corner School, kind of close to the neighborhood. It was quite well attended. Yep. Um, I would say there was probably 20 or 25 yep. residents, property owners in attendance. Um, and we got some good feedback. Mm -hmm. um, I think the primary thing changed after that neighborhood meeting was to look at the buffers yeah. from the proposed zone to the RF to make sure they were sufficient so that should any new development happen, it's not crowding um, the RF zone properties next door. Um, and Councillor Katarina, you can certainly add on to any other yeah. uh, feedback that uh, uh, you thought we received. Um, I'm on the Long Range Planning Committee, and I am a direct abutter to this. Mm -hmm. um, and we did have, a I thought, a very successful neighborhood meeting. Um, the folks were pretty interested. They asked some great questions. Yep. They had some concerns. We've all had concerns about that area, so what's going to happen to it, because we are so close to the Payne Road, but yet it's very rural. We want to retain that rural feel uh, in that area. Um, so I thought people asked some great questions. Mm -hmm. Dan was very helpful in explaining a lot of it. Um, so I, 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 it, it's been thoroughly vetted as far as I'm concerned by the neighbors, because I've also talked to a couple of them. I re I'm related to some of them. So. No, I, <laughs> um, I guess, no, sorry. Um, no, that's fine. I, I guess, too, my other question is, where are we in conjunction of, um, in the lower portion where you're changing to RF mm -hmm. on Holmes Road, which was previously B2. And I'm trying to picture that stretch of road in my head and I'm thinking the speedway. Is that this what where is the where is that in correlation to this map? The speedway is let me get out my cursor. If you can see this, I know it's hard the speedway is over here. Um, so the speedway is west. Uh, and the opposite side of the street and west of where this RF area is proposed. Um, so what would be across the street from where it's proposed is RF is the Scarborough Auto Parts site. Okay. There's also, mm -hmm. um, there's not much there. There's the town owns a little piece of land and then there's Scarborough yeah. Auto Parts yeah. and there's the, the old town uh, transfer station and then the speedway. So okay. this isn't across from the speedway. That's down a bit. <laughs> Was there any discussion in long range, and I'm just remembering some recent, maybe last year or so changes we did up around the speedway because that was to encourage light industrial. Right. So I'm just wondering how on that segment of Payne Road turning to RF relates to turning everything else around it a little more industrial. Right. Um, they did talk a fair amount about that. and and also participating in this whole process of the owners of the golf course, because that's the back nine, that's the that's all de currently developed as golf course or it's wetland. And so the committee looked at that a fair amount and felt that given the existence of the golf course and that there's no intentions of that going away anytime soon as a golf course. Mm -hmm. um, and then other than the golf course, the fact that it's, a lot of wetland that's not particularly contiguous or there's not big pieces of upland to do light industrial type development that you need a lot of space, but there is enough upland to do some, you know, two family or single family along the golf course, more of a golf course yeah. community that you can add in houses along the fairway and not be, um, not need large tracts of land. That was the direction the committee went. Um, mm -hmm. There's a question. Um, I have a comment. <laughs> I have a comment. Uh, Helps see the... Yeah, you know, I think I'm going to spend the next, I guess my comment, I'm going to spend some time maybe driving through there and just looking a bit. I, I appreciate what you were saying, and I can see absolutely what you're talking about up there. I think I'd like to, you know, I'll support it tonight. Um, but 
maybe I might not have second reading without a slight change. I know. Um, of course. You do. Yeah. Well, I I just I want to go back to RF. I know has been a nasty little thing that has been used to curb how we build things. That 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 gets used a lot is to you know there's big setbacks, there's high. You know, but I want to point out it's farming. If you allow it, I can put a piggery and be a pig farm next to your golf course. And I just, I, I want you to really understand how does that tie in with my manure pile and my hogs that smell yeah. right next to your golf course and your light industrial. So I, I just question about on maybe the front piece that really being the most appropriate zoning for it. So. Uh, Maybe that a different zoning just on that strip on that Holmes Road strip. Maybe mm, something along else the, is a little along more the front edge of Holmes Road. Is that yeah, what you think of? That something else might be a little more appropriate. Um, so you're talking so about down the line if there's if the golf course is no longer in existence. It's no longer there and it's gone. And and what are you really looking at down the line? Do you. I uh, I can buy it and I can put my pig farm there or my slaughterhouse or my. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Um, I'm up, I'm up. I know one of the intentions or possible future intentions of the golf course is to put some housing in there, uh, which would be allowed under the IRS. It gives them some flexibility because they, uh, by the amendments that we've we've introduced here, uh, it gives them some upland account towards that acreage requirement in the IRS. Uh, as someone who, well, being in real estate, and also. Um, wanting to maintain as much as we can, I'd like to, I'd like to see the golf course stay there myself as long as possible. Uh, I think allowing the owners of the golf course to do a small development down there, like well, I'll say Doomgrass, for example, is a place where they've done some, you know, condos and whatnot. Mm -hmm. It's a lifestyle that a lot of people like. Mm -hmm. okay. um, that that was the intent there was doing the IRS. So that's what we were thinking to help preserve the rural nature of that back nine for oh. just to, to add on, um one thing we can provide before a public hearing or second reading is we can get more information on the um the wetland mapping because that was yeah. also talked about a lot is that area is pretty wet, mm -hmm. um, particularly even along Holmes Road. So um, it may not be conducive to sort of light industrial, but we can look at that further to see if you know there is enough upwind to make that a good zoning choice, or if it's probably not going to be developed regardless. You know, it might just be a road to get back to maybe some houses along the golf course, and that might stay undeveloped along Holmes. <clears throat> yeah, I guess the only hot burn I have is um, multi-family dwellings limited to no more than 12 talking apartments, mm -hmm. um, multiplex <clears throat> dwellings, townhouses. I don't know. I kind of like uh, the uh, single-family house uh, outlook on it. But um, we'll see as we move forward. Um, and when you talk about cluster housing, mm -hmm. um, and you were saying with uh, shared septic, now is that, did they do that up by the new development up by Scar uh, Beechridge Speedway with all the multi-houses in there? Those are single-family houses, right. and they are on enough acreage to have their own mm -hmm. septic system. So. Um, the town hasn't seen a lot of, say, duplexes on a shared septic. The areas we've allowed it mm -hmm. in town is the North Scarborough area around, um, you know, Route 22 and 114, um, so so that there can be a duplex. But you need larger acreage. You need um, you need an acre of land to have adequate. Yep area for, for leach fields and such. So it's not high density, you know, right. it's it's an acre or two um, lot size and then... Yeah. Um, 
I know the soil conditions have to be right and such, but you know, I, I, when I go by, I look at that and I see them all both on both sides of the road. And if they've each got their own septic and they've each got their own well right in the line, I, I just wonder about groundwater contamination being that clustered, not on sewer. Right. <laughs> I'm sure some an engineer has figured out and said it's okay, but. Yeah, you need 100 feet between your leach bed right, and right, your, yeah. your well. Uh, yep. Um, I think that's it for comments and questions from me. Well, it's okay. Seeing none. Um, all those in favor? Opposed? Uh, order number 1458 is the first reading referred to the planning board the proposed amendments to Chapter 405 of the Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance to make updates to the RH, the RH2 districts, and the Conservation Subdivision Design Standards. Okay, anybody from the public like to speak on this order? Seeing none, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? Is there any? I think we've discussed it. So to speak. No, I just don't know if there's any additional discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Order number 1459 is the first reading and schedule a public hearing for the proposed amendment to Chapter 404A, the Town of Scarborough Plumbing Ordinance. Okay. Um, I suppose I should have Dan explain this one for us. This is the one we just discussed in terms of allowing shared um, septic systems right. in specific zones. Okay, anyone like, by sewer. anyone like to speak to this order? Seeing none, do I have a motion? No, pro. Second. Second. Discussion? Seeing none? Hope? I just, just, yeah, well, you know, I know you were. <laughs> shooting for eight, we're going for it. Um, I just thought this was part of it that I do like is, is the concept of being able to share a septic. I know that's been an um, mm -hmm. ongoing problem, especially in the RF zones mm -hmm. as you get west, that, you know, somebody that would potentially like to maybe build a duplex, which is a more, you know, affordable, smaller space for, for people, and, and you wind up having to, by default, build two full septic systems that right. it gets expensive quick. So um, I am kind of interested and glad to see, you know, some wiggle room and some of our design standards, you know, coming into play, so. Yeah, and, but the, uh, <coughs> get back to where I was, the question. Um, we'll say, for an example, multi-family dwelling, 12 units, um, that would be on a shared septic? No, it's, the the way it's structured in the amendments to the plumbing code is you can't have more than four units per building on the same septic. So um, there wouldn't be the allowance to go to 12 units per building unless the area was served by sewer. So this isn't opening the door for large apartment buildings or large multifamily oh. to, to be served by a common septic, but mm -hmm. more modest uh, scenarios where there's a two to four unit building um, could be oh. sh shared. Okay, all right, thank you. Any other questions? Council Benedict? Um, I'm licensed in Massachusetts, not in Maine, and I think Dan will have an answer to this. When you put in cluster um, septics, doesn't the state get to overwrite whatever we think is possible as far as how many gallons and size and yeah. there's got to be there's got to be room for a second the thing fails because one of the biggest problems in Massachusetts was the houses that were built in the 50s and 60s they had their septic and then the footage that they decided they wanted to be was supposed to be part of a uh, building plan but when it came to be the 90s, and we're going to fix the septic, everything had changed. So 
So all these things that they thought they were doing so good mm -hmm. fell flat on their face because it got to the point that if they had to redo the septic, which was part of the original building agreement, they couldn't use it. And then they ended up starting with muck jobs, which I know that from putting them in here that they're still allowable. But you know, your muck jobs get, get problematic because you basically take it out the whole area and the farmers like it, but their neighbors don't like it because <laughs> it's it's digging up the whole thing and moving it. Right. I'm just saying, whatever we decide can be overrun by the state. I assume. Oh yeah, our plumbing ordinance needs to be in compliance with the state uh, wastewater standards, um, and in some cases, the town has a stricter plumbing ordinance than the state. That's why we actually have a local plumbing ordinance. A lot of towns just defer to the states. So, um, yeah, it, it needs to comply with state standards as well as local standards, and this this language is consistent with that. Dan, um, is there, in, in the state of Maine, is there any um, history of these multi, um, well, four unit septic systems? In the state, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, most okay. of the state Communities aren't served by sewer systems like right. like the eastern side of Scarborough. So um, it's not that common in Scarborough because we have the benefit of the sanitary district and we haven't allowed for a lot of these because mm -hmm. we've been focusing multifamily development where it's um, connected to the sanitary district system. But there's communities throughout the state that don't have oh, okay. um, public systems and have mul have duplexes, have three to four unit buildings on septic. Oh, okay. All right. Anyone else? Seeing none. All those in favor? Opposed? Order number 14-60 is act on the request to ratify the collective bargaining agreement between the Town of Scarborough and the Scarborough Professional Firefighters Association, IASF Local 3894. Mr. Chair and Council, yes. to please the Council and the public, um, Jacqueline Mandrake, right. HR Director, is here and she can provide a, a very quick summary um, that encapsulates the, the essence of the contract settlement. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. I am pleased to report tonight that we've reached a tentative three-year contract with the firefighter and EMT bargaining unit with the town. The negotiation process was really collaborative with a lot of give and take by both the union and the management teams to balance all of the interests, um, treating our employees fairly, supporting them in the dangerous and important work that they do, keeping the town's financial interests in mind, and as well as the council's goals that we outlined during the budget process. There are three big pieces I just want to briefly touch on today. The cost of living adjustment that the employees will receive and uh, also the changes to the health and the retirement benefits that we offer. So the COLA increase for July 1st will be 1.9%. Um, that's the first year of the contract. The second and third year of the contracts uh, outline a 2% cost of living increase with a delayed implementation of three months. The retirement plan, we are offering the option for employees to move to a 25-year, two-thirds uh, benefit plan. This shifts the cost from the town to the employee. Um, employees have a one-time option to make that change, and the new employees will also be uh, funneled into that plan. And then for the health benefits, we are currently offering two health plans to employees, a POSA and a POSC. Um, we're removing the POSA plan, that's a, a richer plan that is more expensive for both the town and the employee, and we're offering a higher deductible plan with an incentive for employees to elect to move to that plan. Um, so those are the three, three major pieces. Um, I, I think it was, like I said, a, a really uh, collaborative and cooperative process, and, I, and I'm pleased that we reached this agreement. Hey, any questions? Mm -mm. Yeah, none. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Do I have a motion? So move. Motion. Second. Second. Okay, discussion. Anyone have any discussion? 
Councilman uh, Donovan. Uh, I was very encouraged to hear that it was a uh, very positive environment in which uh, uh, management and the union uh, discussed and compromised, mm -hmm. and there was a reflection of the uh, the important issues that the town has of maintaining fiscal responsibility, but at the same time being fair to our employees. So that that report, I think, is well received. Yeah, there, there's some cost savings to the town with the negotiated contract and. Um, this also was some uh, language changes uh, which made it uh, for management to uh, better facilitate uh, con uh, employee control um, over a couple of issues. So um, everything seemed to work out well. The union representatives uh, worked well with uh, management and uh, it looks like a win-win for both. So I'll be supporting this action. Anyone else? Councilor Benedict. Uh, I'll be supporting it also. Uh, my two of, two uh, important things in any of the business we do is fair and reasonable. And in having discussions and listening to them, it looks like there was nobody came out of it with a black eye, and nobody came out of it with a double fudge Sunday. But they put it together, and they, they could work together. So the and they met each other somewhere, they could look at somebody and say, hi, how you doing? So, as Bill said, win-win. Uh, and considering the year we've had, <laughs> a win-win is real nice. <laughs> and no one's going to come out of it with the black eye. That's it. Anyone else down the sun? Anyone up? Okay. Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? None. Order number 1461 is act on the request to see if the town of Scarborough will vote to amend its main per service retirement plan for the firefighters effective July 1st, 2014. This order relates directly to the contract settlement. Uh, as was alluded to, there's a, a changes to the retirement program and the council as the governing body must uh, authorize the change to that retirement plan, and that's what this action does. Okay. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, questions or discussion? Anyone have questions on? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? None. Order 14-62 is act to certify the results of the June 10, 2014 school budget validation referendum. Okay. Um, do you have anything on that, Tom? Uh, actually, Tody could probably speak to it better than I. Uh, this is just for the council ratifying the actual votes um, on um, last Tuesday. Is that last Tuesday? Mm -hmm. We have a motion. Ooh, okay. Um, did I hear a second? Yeah. Second. Okay. <laughs> Discussion. Council Benedict? No, it looks like like the other thing that they had discussed. <laughs> the majority are happy with it. I'm going to vote for it. Going up this end. Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Uh, Order number 1463 is act on the request to adopt the 2014-2015 school budget resolution as required by state statute. All right. Did you I would just mention this is always kind of a curious vote. Uh, I think councilors always kind of scratch their head as to why we're doing this right. once everything's said and done. It is a state requirement. Um, I assure you the numbers in front of you uh, have not changed whatsoever and they reflect uh, the will of the voters on June 10. Okay, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second, Council Benedict. Discussion? <coughs> None. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed. On action items? 
none at this time. Standing and special committee reports. Council Blaze. Um, I attended the senior advisory board meeting the other day, and nothing of significance came out of it. So, so okay. and I'll let uh, our chairman of the finance committee report on the finance committee. Okay. Council Benedict. No, we had no meetings, no business. All set. Hi, thank you. Council Katerina. Yes. Um, went to the Greater Portland Council Government's assemb I guess they call it the assembly meeting or board meeting today. And the town of Scarborough won an award. I was pretty excited about that. And I'll read it very quickly. It says a recognition award presented to the town of Scarborough for best practices and cost effective management strengthen municipal services and citizen participation. Greater Portland Council of Governments commends the Town of Scarborough, its Town Council, Planning Board, Town Manager, Fire Chief, Planning Director, and the Scarborough Vision Committee, a citizen-based committee formed by the Scarborough Economic Development Corporation, and the Scarborough Chamber of Commerce for exemplary collaboration in creating a cross-trained position of commercial code enforcement officer Fire Inspector, designed to improve coordination and communication between the Fire Department, the Code Enforcement Division, and applicants in the development process. Uh, and I would like to congratulate everyone. I, being the newbie on board, I didn't have anything to do with it, but I got to shake Ed Sussovic's hand. So. And Tom got to speak. So I just want to let you know about that. Um, and then I missed the Conservation Commission meeting, so I don't have anything to report on that. Sorry. Councilor Donovan. No, no, we did not have any uh, committee meetings. Councilor uh, Holbrook. <laughs> so, uh, Monday, August 4th at 9 a.m. will be the next finance committee meeting. Um, so, I just wanted to give you two a heads up. I know I said I'd get back to you. Yeah, thank um, you. So what will happen is we will not be meeting in July due to some scheduling conflicts, but in August that will be in replace of our August meeting. So at that time what the Finance Committee will be doing is going over the year-end financial. We'll be at 12 per, um, at our 12-month reporting, so we'll have our final numbers as far as municipal and school um, money spent, places that are overextended, underextended, so on and so forth. Hopefully it's all good news. Um, so while we met, um, which was Tuesday, last Tuesday, um, we did go over the current financial statements. There's nothing all that exciting to report. We seem to be fairly on target as far as municipal spending. Um, there was a, a slight thing on the uh, school side where they are a little bit unspent, but they do have their last payment, so I expect that number to balance out a little bit. Um, the other thing is um, we did have, um, for, for one of our main topics, outside agency allocations. As you may recall, every year we have a number of, um, well, of, of groups that come to us and ask um, for donations. We did not expand upon that dollar amount that we give to outside agencies. In fact, I don't think we have in three years um, no. coming to mind. We've kept that at a flat level funding. Um, the one change that maybe is somewhat different is um, we did have a last um, a, a, a request that has not come to fruition. They are not asking for their funds, although I'm not entirely sure if they went belly up or, or what it was. Um, I believe the amount was 700 or so dollars. So what we proposed as a finance committee was to take $700 that would normally be that um, company's disbursement for the year. Um, and to invest that in our town fuel assistance program that we do with Project Grace. Um, so I'm not sure if that needs to be a council action or not, but um, just to keep you up to speed. So we have historic preservation. preservation. There'll be a meeting August 5th at 6.30. Again, there'll be no meeting in July. They continue to work on um, site work, so they're currently walking around looking at set of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the night, sorry, um, cemeteries and doing site visits and cataloging and, and, and trying to find. Um, we have a lot of 
cemeteries in town, so um, it's a bit of a daunting task, so I thank them kindly for doing it. Um, we'll also be talking about the outreach effort. Um, there is a prepared letter, I believe, at this point. Um, if it's not prepared, it's about to be finished. Um, that we plan that that group plans on historic preservation is going to mail to the individual property owners out of the list that we're looking at. So the list that's being generated for council approval, we'd like to meet with those property owners prior to coming to council. That way to get some feedback from them um, as far as um, what are maybe some property owner concerns, what are maybe some ideas that they might have to help them to keep it and, and to encourage them to maintain it in its wonderful, perfect state. Uh, also, appointments did meet this evening. There are some names to post. All of them are to the Senior Program Advisory Board. We have Philip Christie, Troy Hendrickson, and Susan Wilder. Um, I do want to take a moment just to um, encourage anybody that has any interest in serving on some of our committees. We do have many, 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 many vacancies on many, many, many committees, um, and we could greatly appreciate um, any any effort or help from the community. So we do have some openings on the Board of Assessment Review. We have openings on the Coastal Water and Harbor Committee. We have Community Services and Recreation Advisory Board. We have openings on Conservation Commission. We do still have openings on Historic Preservation, on the Housing Alliance, as well as Pest Man Management Advisory Committee, and the Senior Program Advisory Board still has one opening. Um, and that's it for committee reports. Thank you. The uh, one committee report I have to report on is uh, Canine Education and Enforcement Committee. Met last night and had an organizational meeting and uh, went very well. Uh, everybody seemed happy to be there and willing to go to town working on the um, uh, certain criteria that we put forth for them to uh, look into. Uh, I see a lot of enthusiasm and uh, I think they'll uh, work well together. So, um, and uh, Counselor um, St. Clair is going to be the, the liaison uh, to that committee. So with that, um, we'll uh, go to the uh, manager's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I just thought I'd take a brief moment and perhaps update the, certainly the council and those at home. Um, I had previously mentioned that we uh, recently met earlier this month with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as a part of our ongoing effort to stay in touch with them. Uh, they've not got back to us in terms of uh, how we fare uh, as regards the settlement agreement and the fine amount, but all of these conversations we're having help inform uh, their understanding of our efforts and our ongoing efforts. And so if, if you'll indulge uh, me for just a moment, I'd like to just tick off a number of things that we've accomplished in a short time. Um, and I kind of couch these under something called Plover Awareness and Protection Initiatives. Uh, this is a, a document I did send to them so they have this to refer to. Just very quickly, we've developed two different educational materials, pamphlets that are provided at any number of locations, certainly at the town clerk's office, but uh, they're actually in volunteers' hands and on the beach, and those are being handed out by the thousands at this point. Uh, we've done a fair degree of outreach and certainly can do more, but there's been a Facebook page created which has helped connect with some people and connect them to each other. Uh, we've, as you are aware, there are some staff enhancements. We have a full-time, not a full-time, but a seasonal beach man uh, monitoring coordinator. Who is, uh, whose chief responsibility is to coordinate all the monitoring programs. And, and uh, Ryan Wynn, whom I, I think uh, appeared here one evening and introduced himself, has done a great job of really stepping into that role quickly. Um, again, with the blessing of council, we have some um, enhanced law enforcement through our reserve officer program, and Officer Jack Antonio is providing uh, great assistance for us um, at the beach areas and the other reserve officers have been fu uh, hired as well. Uh, we've done our training that has uh, involved Maine Audubon, and that's uh, been directly with public works, reserve, and community um, services staff. Those folks that are on the beach on a frequent basis have all received um, the, the best training that we have available. Uh, there is a volunteer monitoring program that's been established, 
As of two weeks ago, there were 30 committed folks, and I think that's grown since. And part of our challenge now, there are chicks present on two beaches that I'm aware of, on Higgins Beach and Pine Point. Um, our goal is to have volunteers in place during those critical morning hours, sunrise to nine. And so uh, that's seven days a week uh, for the next 40, 45 days or so. So that's quite a commitment, uh, but we think it's a real important part of us honoring um, the spirit of the ordinance and, and providing the best protections we can. Uh, signage has been replaced throughout town at the beach areas. Um, I mentioned we've, we're still evolving uh, with this uh, chick protection plan. Uh, honestly, with these uh, chicks mobile on the beach, the things have changed. Um, it was easy enough to locate the nest and see that the, <laughs> the eggs were still in it. Now that they're mobile on the beach, it's a different dynamic that we're trying to manage with. Uh, enforcement, uh, we've been very active and actually citations have been written for infractions um, in the beach areas. A number of operational changes regarding our beach cleaning activities, uh, trash receptacles and, and collection practices. We continue to interface with our partner agencies at the state and federal level. And as the chairman mentioned, there's a canine education enforcement committee that's just getting up and running and uh, they are tasked with doing some pretty important stuff that will, I think, dovetail nicely with uh, many of the efforts I just uh, provided an overview on. And again, if I could just um, accentuate that point, that just be hyper vigilant with the chicks on, on the beach, particularly in those unrestricted areas. If people choose to have their dogs off leash, they really need to be aware that uh, things can happen very, very quickly. And I personally would encourage people to uh, when they approach those areas, uh, uh, perhaps put them on a leash just to be absolutely safe. But uh, I just issue that plea or that warning. Also, I want to mention the flood maps that have been talked about for a better part of three years. We just received word today that the appeals period will be delayed further, uh, and I think for good reason. Um, they've actually convened a third party they call it a scientific review panel that is evaluating FEMA and their consultants' basic methodology, which is a point that we've uh, questioned right along. Mm -hmm. um, one of the great things for us is the consultant that's assisted us is the one that's responsible for this, uh, for many of the questions that are being asked and, and explored um, in, in elsewhere in Region 1. So there will be a further delay. I don't have a, an idea of timeline, but it's certainly months at this point. <clears throat> And I did attend with Councilor Katarina a tour of Wentworth School this week, Monday evening. Uh, the building committee had what might be their last meeting, I don't know, uh, at, in the library at the old school, and we all took a tour of the new school. I think you'll see activities pick up very quickly. Uh, they're, doing, they're moving out the final products, and you'll see demolition occur within a week or 10 days, and I think it will go fairly swiftly, frankly. And lastly, a quick project update. Uh, Highgate Parkway repaving is, is being done as we speak, so be aware. Uh, it's certainly passable, but there may be some delays. Um, Pike is the contractor for DOT. They will be moving in and doing portions of Payne Road immediately after that, so that area of town is going to be busy for the next couple of weeks. Our Pleasant, Hole, Pleasant Hill Road reconstruction project is going um, is, is uh, fully uh, in motion at this point. I haven't received any complaints. Uh, I think there are some challenges with traffic in the area, but we have reader boards and we do require that they maintain at least one, t one lane of travel at all times. So, so far so good. The project is going on uh, as scheduled. And lastly, we did open bids for a set of infra uh, intersection improvements, really pedestrian improvements down here at the intersections of Gorham Road, Hannaford Drive, and Wentworth Drive. Um, this is part of the Oak Hill Pedestrian Plan and a piece that we really negotiated with the school project in exchange for our assistance on wetland mitigation. Um, some members of council might remember that. So we've opened bids. I think we need to revisit some of them. The, the bids came in a little higher than budget, but I think we can massage that back into a workable uh, program. All of those improvements are scheduled to be done this summer, and so they're, they'll be operational and functional for the kids when they come back in September. So with that, I'm certainly available for questions. Any questions? Thank you. Okay. Councilor Holbrook. 
Um, comments, yeah. So, um, <laughs> no, I just had one, just a friendly reminder. Um, as you know, 4th of July is rounding the corner. Um, of course, we don't meet the first, first week in July. Um, so just a friendly reminder um, with the way our fireworks ordinance is written, um, certain days, depending on how the dates fall. So for this year, um, for the folks at home, Thursday the 3rd, yes, fireworks are legal, but only until 10 p.m. And then Friday, it's the regular until 12.30 p.m., which is the 4th, and then it should be as well on Saturday. So, but Thursday is 10. 10 is the cutoff. So, um, other than that, have a happy, wonderful, safe 4th of July. Well, we are uh, we're six weeks since we passed the uh, ordinance provisions related to the protection of lovers and control of dogs, and it's been a tremendously active period, as our town manager was describing, and and a great start in many. Uh, probably the most important respect is there's more plovers than people can ever remember being on our beaches. Uh, uh, Pine Point, uh, uh, Margo Hodgkins keeps giving me reports and, and says it's remarkable for the number of uh, plovers and chicks on, uh, on Pine Point. Uh, it creates challenges, but it's exciting because it's, uh, uh, it's a worthwhile effort uh, uh, on the town's behalf to successfully implement this program. Uh, we have a plover coordinator who has organized volunteer groups at each beach. Uh, I volunteer at Higgins Beach and I put in for a stint at Pine Point just to see what's going on. It gives me a sense to be able to report to all of you of, of how things are going. Uh, and uh, I will tell you that the uh, Scarborough residents have been very compliant. Uh, it's been great to see because uh, we have a full team headed by Glenna Shabbat doing a great job out at Higgins Beach, and there have been quite a few people who have been non-compliant, but they're mostly out-of-town people. And so there's an education process that's been going on, and it's pretty interesting that, that I think it's been effective and that the uh, residents of the town of Scarborough have been, have been aware of, of what the rules are and complying with them. So that well, was good to see. Uh, the coordinator has also done a great job with signage and with educational materials in the short time that he had available to put that together. It was a lot of uh, good collaborative work. Uh, we've also learned a lot about what our signage deficiencies are. And so it's been a constant process to develop the signage that's necessary so that people actually are properly informed. Uh, so uh, uh, that's been uh, that's been uh, great. I will say that uh, if uh, people want to take a walk down to the Spurwink River uh, at Higgins Beach, it's just there are monitors uh, in the uh, morning and in the evening almost every hour, and so they're aware of where the plovers are. And a lot of people have enjoyed saying, "I've never seen one," uh, and do they really exist? And we can show you uh, the monitors are aware of them. We can kind of point them out, and it's exciting to kind of see an endangered species that's uh, kind of just making his way along the beach with these little chicks that are no more than the size of a cotton ball. So that's, uh, it's remarkable that they survive, <laughs> totally remarkable. Uh, the, uh, I wanted to comment on the approval of the budget. <clears throat> uh, you know, balancing the interests of school supporters and uh, people who are looking for greater fiscal responsibility in our budgeting and, and tax impact is, is a hard task. It's one that we grappled with and we came together and we made a decision and the vote I think shows that the town is fairly evenly split. Uh, uh, both votes were very, very close. The, the two highs, two lows, just right, they came out very, very close. Uh, and I think when no one is really thrilled with the outcome, perhaps we fairly balance those interests. So uh, I do think that the feedback I'm getting is begrudging acceptance that it was probably about the right spot. Uh, school people not very happy, uh, people who wanted to see a greater restraint, uh, but uh, I think it was unrealistic under the circumstances that we were presented with. Uh, so that was, uh, uh, that was good. So... <clears throat> 
Thank you. Okay, Councilor Caterina. Yeah, um, actually, I'll spin off from what you were just mm -hmm. talking about. Uh, I had my open office hour, and um, school board uh, member finance chair, Chris Cayazzo, sat with me. Regretfully, we didn't have any public, but that's okay. I was there if anyone wanted to come in. But we spent an hour chatting, uh, the two of us, uh, and I am very hopeful that we can have some sort of a working group. I know I've been talking to Chairman Sullivan about this, um, where the school board and the town council are talking earlier about you know what, what are the goals of each and how we can uh, try to avoid this, this split. Because there is a natural split in this town. As I've always said, it's the tale of two Scarboroughs. Um, the younger people and the families and then those who've been here for a long time or are on, are on fixed incomes or whatever. And so there's this tension that goes on that um, I'd like to see uh, mitigated to some degree so that we can move forward and not have such contentious um, discussions and votes and revotes and everything else uh, if we can avoid that. Um, that being said, I did go to see Wentworth School as uh, uh, Manager Hall mentioned. It's a beautiful building um, and I, I, having been an educator myself, uh, it's enough to make me think, geez, I wouldn't mind going back teaching a building like that. And it should last us for many, many years to come. The way it's been designed, it's, it's got built-in growth, you know, for the growth of town. If town grows more, uh, it, it, I thought it was very well planned uh, and done. Um, and then the last thing is uh, my neighbors, the Huffs, they had some input on the long-range planning. and. I just wanted to wish them a happy 45th anniversary. They were going to come tonight, but they were on a cruise for their 45th anniversary. Nice. So I just wanted to congratulate them on that. Thanks. That's it. Thank you. Councilor Benedict. The only thing that, that, that I have, and I, I don't know how to have it followed up, um, we spent good money in putting blinking signs on the Pine Point Road by the bridge and then again on Black Point Road by the Eastern Trail. And I witnessed something that scared the living daylights out of me. Last Sunday, there was a woman with three kids, two in a double stroller, however you say it. She stood and waited for the lights. Because one of my daughters was with me going, what are these? So I explained what it was. I watched this woman, following directions, stepped off the curb. The minute she stepped off the curb, the light stopped. Mm. That was a pretty horrifying thing because she was doing everything right. And the, the, the safety aspect of the thing, and then I watched it happen again. They pulled over the side of the road by the street. And I said, I just said, we're going to see what happens here. This is ridiculous. And especially with the summer coming on, a lot of people outside can't afford to have it that way. It needs to be fixed, please. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Thank you. <coughs> Council Blaze. Well, I'd just like to say that I'm um, absolutely delighted that we approved the purchase of the Benjamin Farm. I think it's going to be a wonderful addition to the to the town and to everyone who lives in the town and to n neighboring communities. And I want to thank you all for voting for it. Thank you. Um, I also, um, for, for years and years and years, um, being on the council, I've heard question over and over again. What about the Benjamin property? What about the Benjamin property? Well, I'm glad to say I won't have to hear that again. <laughs> so it's a done deal. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I, you know, I, I think, you know, I truly believe that that was a, a, a perfect purchase um, with the money set aside for purchases of uh, land trust property or property for the citizens of Scarborough to enjoy. Um, 
That being said, I'd like to thank uh, the 30 plus um, beach volunteers, um, clover lovers and dogs group alike for um, volunteering their time to help make sure the plovers and the plover chicks stay safe. The, uh, as far as the Wentworth tour, um, I was unable to attend because of the circumstances that I'm under with a uh, wife with a broken ankle and um, two children to watch and take care of. So that's keeping me busy plus work. Uh, and I wanted to mention uh, during, um, during the budget hearing, I heard people talk of sidewalks to nowheres, and uh, as I travel in town a lot of times, I pay attention to the sidewalks, and I've seen a lot of people using mm -hmm. the sidewalks on the Dunstan uh, side of town, and I've seen a lot of people using them on the Oak Hill side of town, and I see more people now recreating down to the eastern than I ever have, because it's safe now. And uh, as far as the, uh, the uh, crossing lights, um, I don't know how they're working right now, but when they first were installed, the, since they've been installed, I have seen uh, people slam their brakes on to stop for people in the crosswalk now. So I think that has been a great improvement over what I've seen in the past that angered me with children waiting in the crosswalk. No one would stop. They keep going by and by and by and by. And the VIPs were down on the Easton one day counting how many um, cars in a short period of time went, would not stop for people. And it was mind-blowing how many people did not stop for people in the crosswalk. So I think we've um, actually made it safer for people crossing on the Eastern Trail, uh, get the glitches out, and uh, I think we'll be fine. Uh, and I can't wait till they uh, introduce one down by the Wentworth. That's another contention of mine. It has been for a long time. I've down there seeing children trying to cross and nobody would stop, and I'm just like, I'm beside myself. So I guess this is what it takes in this town to get people to stop uh, pedestrians, is strobe lights. <laughs> so with that being said, um, I, oh, one other thing I wanted to touch on was, um, yep, um, one other thing I wanted to touch on was um, uh, what Councilor Donovan said, with uh, the town being split, it definitely is split. You look at the emails that we received over the period that we were debating the budget, and it's pretty much 50-50, and they're both furious with us. <laughs> so it's in a, a no-win situation. Uh, if you lower the tax rate on the schools too much, all the parents are mad at you, and if you don't, and, and, you know, if you lower too much, they're mad at you. If you and if you increase it too much, then you've got the uh, uh, tax pay is angry with you. So it's it's a it's a tough job, and come do it. <laughs> See how you fare. And uh, we all received letters, and uh, I, I think uh, Councilor Donovan would like to um, uh, comment all, on it. We all got letters, uh, uh, personal letters from kids in the school system. This is the K-Kids part of a Kiwanis program, and they all wrote us saying thank you for your good efforts, and they're excited about the new uh, school, the new Wentworth School, and I just think it was a very kind gesture. Uh, really appreciated, yes, really appreciated the, the letter from someone I actually know who lives in my neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, young, young lady, so. Okay, with that being said, uh, I have a motion for adjournment. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye.